Good morning, saints. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. Amen. Praise God. It's a good day to be in God's house. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're starting this series, uh, this back to school. Uh, how many of you brought your notebooks? Uh, either a pen or the number two pencil you were giving last week. Uh, courtesy of uh, the church. We have more. Oh, yeah. Who, who needs a notebook? You're going to take notes. Come on. This is school now. This is school now. Don't come unprepared to school. No, no, no. You need a notebook. You need to take notes. You're not going to remember all that I said. Come on. I'm going to say some important things. <laughs> yeah, you need the notebook. You need a pen or pencil. But let me just say something else about that. I don't want you to just listen with your minds. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I want you to listen with your heart and your spirit. Okay, that's going to take you listening to God through the Holy Spirit, too. Because the Holy Spirit anoints his word, amen, to your hearts. So I don't want you to just listen for facts and write down information. How many know that knowing Jesus and following Jesus is more than just having the right information? How many know that it's a matter of the heart? It's the heart. Proverbs 4, 20, 23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life right? Now, that's not even in my verses, but, <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit can add verses, can he, to my message? <laughs> All, right. All right. So this is heart. I want you to listen with your heart, and I want us to pray first. Let's, let's pray. Let's all pray and ask the Holy Spirit, open my heart, open your heart. I just want the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Amen? Amen. Holy Spirit, we just come to you right now. Open our hearts. Open my heart. Open all our hearts. To hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Spirit is saying to this church about following Jesus. Yes, Lord, open our hearts as well as our minds. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, as Paul prayed for the Ephesians. And we receive it. We know this is your will, so we thank you ahead of time for this spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Thank you, Father, that you're more than willing to show your children revelation from your word about following your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, last, last week, let's see, uh, review class, let's have a review. Review. Quick pop quiz. Pop quiz. Yeah, pop quiz. <laughs> okay, someone raise your hand and say, what did Pastor Stephen teach about last week? Does anyone remember? Yeah, Michael. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? Anyone want to expand on that? Yeah, Jim. He provided some good information on uh, logical, ethical reasons to believe that the Bible is actually inspired. Right, and that it's trustworthy. Helen, did you want to add to that? No, that's what I was going to say. That's what you were going to say. <laughs> that's what you were going to say. <laughs> Anybody else say, what to say? Scriptures. Huh? Collection of scriptures. Scriptures. What about scriptures? A collection of them. Yeah, about how the our canon was formed, how the Bible was formed, how it's trustworthy. How, you know, it's, it's wonderful. And it, it's God breathed. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Was it 2 Timothy 3 16? Yes. All scriptures inspired by God for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be fully, fully furnished. Amen. But now I want to talk to you about what the, who, who this word speaks about. Now, the Bible is the written word of God. That's what we talked about last week. But who is the living word of God? Jesus Christ is the living word of God. Do we worship the Bible? No. Do we worship who the Bible points to? Yes. 
yes, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? And the Bible, guess who the Bible points to as the Word of God, the Logos of God? Jesus. Thank you. Jesus. John, Jesus, this is my first point. Jesus Christ, the living Word of God, if you want to write it down. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Bible points to Jesus as a living word. John also points this in the book of Revelation. He's got a title when he comes, the word of God. He's, he is the log, in the Greek it's the logos, the word, the logos of God. He is the very expression of God. The exact representation of his character, according to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1, 1. Anyway, the exact, he is the image of the invisible God. Amen. And that's, what the, that's who the word of God is, the expression of God is. And let me just share a verse with you. The Pharisees knew the Bible, the Old Testament, didn't they? Did they come, did most of them come to follow Jesus? They missed him. Right. This is what Jesus said in John 5, 39 and 40 to the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You can know the Bible from inside and out, memorize a lot of it, but not know the one who inspired the Bible. Yes, very possible. There's a lot of people who know the Bible, but I don't know if they know the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the last Adam, Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, became a life-giving spirit. We know him by the spirit. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we know no man according to the flesh anymore, not even Christ, implying we know him according to the spirit. The Lord is the spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty, hallelujah. So, and Jesus said in John, John 14, he said, these verses, by the way, the Holy Spirit's having me at him. <laughs> John 14, Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to ask the Father, he's going to send you the what? The comforter, the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And then he calls it the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. But he says, you know what he says after that? And I will come to you. How is he going to come to us? Through the Holy Spirit. In the form of the Holy Spirit, that's how he comes to us. He, he, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. He says this in John 16, verses 12 and 14. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So it's very important, the Spirit. Another verse uh, that I won't read all of it is 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. It says, we know things, Paul says, we know things by the Spirit. You can just read it. I'm not going to read er through every verse, but I think uh, Gracie's displayed in 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 10 through 12. We know things by the Holy Spirit. That's how we really know things in our heart not just up here in our heads. We have to know with our heart and spirit. Amen? Amen? That's how we really get to know the Lord and really get to understand his word is through his spirit in our spirit. And then the other verse that uh, I put down uh, is first Ephesians 5, 1, 15 through 17. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Amen? We know Jesus by the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God. That's how we really know him. That's why the Spirit is so important. So we, when we approach this word starting today, even now, we need to approach it in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, show us, inspire us, show us what you're trying to say to us through your word. Amen? Amen. All right. He's the Spirit of truth. Now I want to go to how many know... I realize this, you can just raise your hand, 
that there's a place in the Bible that what says what the six foundational doctrines of our Christian faith is. How many know there's a place in the New Testament that says what the six foundational doctrines are of the church? Anybody know where it is? <laughs> one, of my, one of my students in my class. I think it's important that we go to the Bible for fi- what the six foundational doctrines are. How many would agree with me? That the Bible would be a good source of what are the six foundational doctrines. Don't you think it would be good to know the six foundational doctrines of the New Testament church? Anyway, they're found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And this is what the six are. The author of Hebrews, whoever it is, we're not sure. Some thought it's Paul, but a lot of them say, no, I don't think it's Paul. Paul always identifies his letters. Hebrews 6, 1. There, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. Here's the six things. Repentance from dead works. Faith toward God, instructions about washings, but most translations have washing, but really the word is baptisms. So I'll, I'll say it how the Greek has it. Instruction about baptisms, plural. Laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Those are the six foundational doctrines, according to Hebrews 6, of the New Testament faith. Now, I'm not going to talk today about the resurrection of the dead. How many believe in the resurrection of the dead? <laughs> and that believers in Jesus will be raised from the dead? Amen. We're not gonna, how many believe that those without Christ are facing eternal judgment? Amen. However, you, you can have a, for sure a full message on that and on each of these six foundations. I have a daunting task I'm going to cover these founda- the first four foundational doctrines, and each, each one easily could be a full sermon, easily, easily, as well as resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So you're going to get a shortened version. If I had a, if I had a series going my, <laughs> my own, I would start a whole series on each one of these. Anyway. All right, because each one deserves its own. All right, let's look at first first one. Repentance from dead works. Whoa, dead works? What is that? What are dead works? Here's what I believe. I don't really have a scripture that says this, but this is just in my knowledge of the Lord and, and, and the word. I believe that dead works are anything done apart from the spirit of Christ. And include all sin as well as all good and religious works apart from Christ. How about that? (laughs) Because some people are trusting in their, quote, good works or their religious works to get them access with God. (laughs) And we're going to find out what what God thinks of that. Anyway, before you were in Christ, you were dead. How many know you were dead? Spiritually dead. Before you were in Christ, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you were under God's judgment. How many knew that they were under God's judgment? I didn't, but I was. I was under his judgment. Because anyone not in Christ is still under the judgment that God has pronounced on Satan and his angels, his fallen angels, fallen angels the demons. So you are under God's judgment. Let me read. I want to read... If, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'll read Romans 3.23. You, know, you all know this one. Some of you can quote it to me. Quote me Romans 3.23. Anyone know it? Jim, you know it. No? <laughs> well, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. How many fall into that category of all? <laughs> all right. You all, we all sinned, right? All right. And then Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> This is what Paul says before we were in Christ. And you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, 
following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That's judgment, like the rest of mankind. We were under God's wrath, under God's judgment. That's a big problem, being under his judgment and under his wrath. And we were dead to boot. <laughs> Serious problems, right? Need a drink. Oh, where's my bottle? Oh, here it is. <clears throat> so, what was our own righteousness like before God, before we were in Christ? Well, Isaiah 64, 6 says, We've all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. To be honest with you, I thought my good works would, would merit me before God before I came to Christ. How many had that same false idea that your good works or your church membership or your infant baptism or your, or your confirmation class or whatever or taking communion, if you were not in Christ and, he, and joined with him, those, all those things were, were like filthy rags to God because they're not, you understand, we've all fallen short of his glory. <laughs> we're talking about the God's glory here. We've all fallen short. And none of, none of our own righteousness will give us any merit before God. So here's where, repentance, let me just say, repentance in, in oh, oh, here's one more verse. Uh, Isaiah 59, 2. God says this, but your iniquities, uh, or this is Isaiah, your iniquities, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So you're, you have a sin problem, and you're separated from God if you're not in Christ. And you need to repent of your dead works. All right. Now let's see. What, let's, let's talk a little bit. So re, here's, here, here's a statement you can write down, or at least some, whatever you can. Repentance involves turning from your sins and from going your own way to following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Repentance involves turning from your sins and going your own way, repenting from that, to following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Greek word is, uh, means a change of mind, but it means more than that. It's not just changing my mind like, oh, how am I going to change my mind now? Now I believe. It's not just a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the heart. How many know it all starts with the heart? Amen. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the first thing. Soul, mind, and strength. It starts with the heart. You have to truly be repentant in your heart. In your heart. And it's, just not, and it's not a matter of just feeling sorry that you sinned. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Or you just, if you just have worldly grief or sorrow for your sin, that's not enough. A godly grief produces, and only, I believe only the Holy Spirit can produce this, produce a repentance that leads to salvation without, without regret. Because really, when it comes right down to it, Repentance is a gift from God. True repentance, I believe, is a gift from God. My scripture on that, I will read now, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant, this is Paul to Timothy, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting the, his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, may perhaps Grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they, may come, that they, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captive, captured, by, captured by him to do his will. You see, it, it's a gift from God. Now, if, if you truly want it, I believe he'll give it to you. I don't believe he's uh, arbitrary. Oh, I think I'll give him gift of repentance him not. I don't believe that at all. I believe if you seek God for repentance, I mean, not like Esau who didn't find it, but God will grant it to you. But anyway, my example of this is the Apostle Paul. 
And uh, it's in Acts 22, verses 3 through 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, he shares his testimony. Paul shares his testimony both in Acts 22 and in Acts 26. And uh, how many know the story of Paul, who was Saul, who was, who was against the Christians, who was putting them in jail, uh, I think even beating them? Uh, yeah, he says, uh, well, I'll just... Anyway, he was beating them, putting them in jail. He was, anyway... Um, trying to cause them to blaspheme. I know in another place it says. Uh, anyway, but, but how many know Jesus appeared to Saul? And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 22.7. And he answered, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you, you are persecuting. He, wasn't even, he was persecuting the Christians, but how many know the Christians are part of Jesus? We're the body of Christ. Saul was persecuting the body of Christ. He said, Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Now those who were with me saw the light, but do not un did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And he and I, and I said, well, what shall I do, Lord? Good start, Paul. <laughs> what shall I do, Lord? He says, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed you to do. So he rose, he went, but he was struck blind in the event, and he went to Damascus. And then the Lord spoke to Ananias, it doesn't even say he was an elder or deacon or just a, a, a disciple of Jesus to go to, to restore his sight. And he goes, and Ananias goes to him in Acts 22 uh, and verse 12. And, one, and Ananias, a devout man according to the law and spoken by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, he, he came, stood beside Saul and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Now, if you check Acts 9-9, you'll see there was three days. Paul was three days blind waiting in Damascus. And now he says, why do you wait? Okay, this is just three days from when he was, became a follower of Jesus. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Three days was a delay. Why are we delaying? Baptism was supposed to be immediate, and he had waited three days. <laughs> Why do you delay? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Acts, Acts 22, 16. Anyway, so that's an example of someone repenting of their sins, turning and going the other opposite, opposite direction. All right. And I remember in my own life when I said, Lord, I give my life to you. How many remember that? When you said, Lord, I give my life to you. Amen. And you meant it. And you followed through. The next thing is faith toward God. The next doctrine, faith toward God. Specifically, it's putting your faith in the risen Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What does it mean to, for having Jesus as your Savior? It means you accept Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross as your sin substitute. Amen? Amen. And it's the only way to have your sins forgiven and have eternal life. Amen? Amen? It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, when Paul was describing what the gospel is, For I delivered to you as of first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. So Isaiah 53, the Old Testament scriptures clearly talks about the one who would die for our sins, get a penalty for our sins. You accept his, his punishment as, for your own. Ephesians, I mean, Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us, and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us, and then while we you were yet, yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, um, my notes, my sermon notes are going to be available at the end. I had Romans 5, 6, but you'll have to correct it. It's Romans 5, 8. All right. And Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, I remember when I first encountered this verse. Whoa, was, I, was it a shock to me? It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not from your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. How many thought that your salvation was because you were doing good deeds or going to church or whatever? I did. Am I the only one? Oh. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just thought, yeah, just be good, right? Like they tell you. Just be good. I'd already been sprinkled as an infant, you know, went to confirmation class. I went to church every Sunday. Of course, my parents made me. <laughs> but, and then I made it a habit in college, too. But anyway, I thought, you know, just be good. Don't kill anybody and, you know, don't rob, don't steal. Anyway, but this says it's a gift. Amen? Amen. You can't earn it. So many people are trying to earn their salvation. You, how many know you can't earn your salvation? No matter how many times you go to church, no matter how many, you know, it's not going to, it's, it's God, there's only one way. You have to trust Jesus as the one who paid your penalty on the cross. It's a gift, not as a result of works. How many want to say amen to that? Amen. And now verse 10, I don't have it here. It says that you can walk in the good works that God creates for you. Then The good works are going to be what God creates in you and lays out for you to do. Amen. There will be good works, but it's what God calls for you. Uh, and then Romans 6.23, many of you know this verse too, that says, for the wage of sin is... Uh, I lost my place. The wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life uh, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, that's the difference. The free gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death. But remember, everything's sin outside of Christ if you're not in Christ. All right, so that's faith toward God. Okay, Christ, and when that happened, guess what? Christ becomes your righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he becomes your righteousness and holiness. This is one of my favorite verses. If you've been in my class, you'll know I say it so often. 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him... Uh, I believe that because of God, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ himself becomes our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and redemption. So when we put our faith in, we don't have our own righteousness, brothers and sisters. It's the righteousness of Christ. How many say Amen. It's the righteousness of Christ. He's our righteousness. Our righteousness, isn't that wonderful? You don't have to have your own righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. You're, in, you're put in Christ, and Christ comes into you, and Christ becomes your righteousness. It's the most wonderful thing. And your holiness. Sanctification means holiness. Christ becomes your holiness. How many, how many, now, granted, we're, we're, as we follow him, we maybe grow in holiness, but how many know that holiness is, is really uh, basically a person. It's Jesus Christ. And when you come into Christ, he becomes your righteousness, he becomes your holiness. So quit trying to establish your own. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> He's your righteousness. He's your holiness. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's glorious. Amen. <laughs> All right. And Paul talks about this in... In uh, Philippians 4, uh, in Philippians, 4, uh, excuse me, Philippians 3, he talks about how he, he was so righteous. He said, concerning the law, I was blameless. That's in Philippians, this is in Philippians 3, 4 through 9. He says, concerning the law, I was blameless. And that's in verse uh, 5. But he says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. He's, talk, he's not talking about sin here. He's talking about all his good religious works as a Pharisee. He counts them as rubbish, garbage. Do you count all your righteousness outside of Christ as garbage? <laughs> Paul did. All the good dudes you thought you were going to get to heaven or merit heaven, he counts it as garbage. His, 
His, he said uh, concerning the righteousness under the law was blameless. He counts that as garbage. It's amazing. Isn't this an amazing gospel? In order, why? He counts them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Hallelujah. Do I hear a hallelujah? Amen. Or something? <laughs> not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Amen. amen. I, I'm not opposed to amens, just to let you know. All right. <laughs> Amen. And you know what else? This, this faith is a spirit of faith that actually comes from Christ. He gives you the faith too. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul says, Since we have the same spirit of faith. It's a spirit. It's part of the Holy Spirit that comes from Jesus. Having the same spirit of faith. According to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believed, and we also speak. You know, it's not something you have to work up. How many are so glad you don't have to work up faith? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Spirit of Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, but it is Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I believe the King James has it right here. And I believe the Greek has, I, I, I've studied a little bit of Greek in seminary. It's been many years, but <laughs> it's, I live by the faith of the Son of God. When I started reading like that, it's like, I don't even have to get my own faith. It's from Jesus inside of me. Is that good news or what? Amen. The faith of Jesus. I can live by his faith, not my own faith, because it's Jesus living his life through me by the power of his spirit. Isn't this good news? I know the gospel is such good. And the gospel is so much more than just having your sins forgiven, although that's glorious. It's the, you don't even have to live the Christian life. He lives it through you because you died. We'll get into more of that about how you died. But anyway. <laughs> All right, so moving right along. Lord, and you accept him as Savior, but you also accept his Lord. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raising him from the dead, you will be saved. You make him Lord of your life. I remember, I remember when I initially made Jesus Lord of my life, and then I remembered within a couple of years later, he realized uh, I really hadn't totally made him Lord of my life. And I had to make another decision to make him total Lord. Anyone have that decision like me? I give it all to you. You're my Lord. Who I choose to marry, what my career is, everything. Like we were singing today. Everything. Wasn't it in one of the songs? Everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many have given everything to the Lord Jesus? <laughs> You're his. You're his and, and he's yours. Oh, hallelujah. Not only are you his, he's yours. From Song of Songs, I'm my beloved and he is mine. <laughs> it's wonderful. So wonderful. And this faith that you have, this spirit of faith, is an obedient faith. Paul talks in Romans 16, 25, and 26. In the end of verse 26, he talks about, according to the, he says, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. In Romans 1, he talks about bringing obedience of faith in the Gentiles. Because how many knows if you have the spirit of Christ in you, he's going to, go to do some things through you. <laughs> and you're going to want to obey him. Amen? The ob so faith has that obedience aspect of it. Amen. All right. So we made it through repentance from dead work and faith toward God. I think we're all ready to go on to the next one. But I need a drink first. I'm doing a lot of talking up here. <clears throat> the next one, so we've covered the first two. Now the third one, instruction about baptisms. It may say washings, but it's baptismo. It's the word for baptism. And I believe the baptisms there is talking about two kinds of baptisms, water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. 
And then it goes on to laying on of hands. I'm going to do them all at the same time. I, I was amazed. When I first was shown <laughs> these six foundational doctrines, I thought, laying on of hands? No one told me the laying on of hands was a foundational doctrine. Where have I been or where have my teachers been? <laughs> laying on of hands is a foundational doctrine? Yep. <laughs> According to Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. All right. Now, let's, what I want to do now is I want to turn to the book of Acts. Ah, let's see how people came to Christ in the book of Acts. All right? Because to me, that's very instructive, how they came to Christ in the book of Acts. How many remember the day of Pentecost when Peter preached in Acts 2? Acts 2, do you remember that? The Holy Spirit filled them, and Peter preached a great message. He talked about the, that Jesus was ascended and poured out what they were seeing and hearing. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me just say, so he says, <clears throat> for this, I'm going to pick up in verse, uh, well, I'll start in verse 32. The, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being ex therefore exalted at the right hand of God. He's preaching to about 3,000 people or more here. And having received the, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out, this what you are seeing and hearing. You know what they were seeing and hearing? They might, some of them saw these tongues of fire, I think, and they were, they were, they were hearing them speaking in their own language. The, 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 I believe the disciples, the 120, were given the ability to speak in languages they never heard. How many know about that? Speaking in tongues. They were speaking in tongues. He said, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's a Psalm 110. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Whoa! A bold sermon, wasn't it? Whom you crucified. Verse 37. When they, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? We crucified the Messiah. Ooh, that's bad news. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your, of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone who the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day 3,000 souls. You see, in the early church, in the book of Acts, which... I kind of think we're trying to get back to. <laughs> the altar call was baptism. The altar call was baptism. And I know it's not so convenient, the water and all that. It's not convenient. It's like, and I've got to find water for 3,000 people. And, you know, we, it's going to take a lot of time. Let's just have him pray. Did he just have him pray? Now, when I came initially to Christ, I just prayed. But you know what? The Lord showed me later about baptism. Maybe some of you. But in the, early, in the New Testament church, the book of Acts, they were all baptized immediately. The church kind of got away from that, you know? In the, I've studied church history and even taught on it. The church eventually started making, you have to go through a, a long waiting period to see if you had truly repented and believed. And if you make it, then we'll baptize you. How many know that's not what the book of Acts teaches? <laughs> that is not what the book of Acts teaches. And the book of Acts teaches what must you do, in this verse at least, what must you do before you're water baptized? Repent. repent. Can babies repent? Okay, the parents can, but that's kind of a dedication. <laughs> anyway, you have to be able to repent, I believe, before, you, before you're baptized. Um, and uh, this is very interesting because uh, I, some of you know that I went to some meetings in South Dakota recently by a group called The Last Reformation. Anyway, and we, I, met, I got to know a guy from Chicago that I took there named Darren, and he was... 
in his past life, and he's an adult now, I don't know, was he, Margaret, in his 30s or something, 35, he had grown up in a supposedly spirit-filled church, been baptized there, everything, but he had never fully repented of things, of the heroin, of other things. He never, and so guess what? He never got set free. He never got set free till he heard the message, hey, brother, you need to repent of these things. You need to repent of this and that and be baptized. You need to repent and be baptized again because baptism is effective after you've repented. So the first step here was repentance, repentance. And you know what? He did. He was convicted. He was convicted in his heart, and he repented of all the stuff, heroin and whatever else, and he was baptized into Jesus Christ. And guess what? He set free. He set free. Didn't have the desire for heroin anymore. He was so shocked. I don't need heroin anymore. Hallelujah! <laughs> Amen. All right, we're going to talk about the... So we're just going to go through the book of Acts now. Okay, repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then if you go on to Acts 8, uh, uh, Philip went down uh, and preached the good news to those in Samaria, Acts 8, 12. And uh, it says in Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip, that he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were, being, they were baptized, both men and women. And even Simon, he was kind of a magician uh, on the wrong side of the spirit world, you might say, himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And after seeing signs and great miracles, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent down to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they only had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And, and when Simon saw it, he wanted to give money to be able to lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. Of course, he was the wrong spirit, and he's rebuked and so forth. Anyway, just to point out here that they expected some sort of manifestation of the Spirit that they kind of knew uh, some believe it's speaking in tongues. I believe that's one of the possible manifestations. There was some sign that they'd receive what I will call the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? If they didn't really get filled with the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They laid hands on them, you know, they'd hands on them to be, uh, receive the fullness of the Spirit. And the hands, it's, the, the thing about the hands, laying on hands, this is a point of contact for your faith. Because everything has to be by faith, amen? It's not that there's necessarily magic in the hands, but this point of faith, it was a symbolic of them receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And if you go on later, and I'm not going to take time to read it, later in Acts 8, you see that the Ethiopian eunuch, he was baptized immediately. If you go to Acts 10, which we'll go to now, uh, Peter was preaching to the Gentiles, and, and while he was preaching the gospel of the Gentiles, guess what? The Holy Spirit fell on them, and they began speaking in tongues. That's in 1046, and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, sometimes it's out of order, but I, usually it's you repent and be baptized and uh, receive the Holy Spirit. But in Peter's case, he didn't even know that Gentiles could be saved yet. <laughs> so God had to kind of reverse the order and pour out the Spirit and cause them to speak in tongues. And Yes, Peter, it's okay to baptize them into Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, he had to give them how many he had a vision before that too about eating unclean things. God commanded him to eat unclean things. So God had to show him the Gentiles were no longer unclean. The Jews counted that Gentiles as unclean. So anyway, what we see again, fullness of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and water baptism into Christ. All right, and then if we go to Acts 16, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I'm kind of running out of time. How many know the story of the, of the Philippian jailer getting saved? Yeah, he, he was going to kill himself, and then Paul said, 
don't kill yourself. We're still here, even though the earthquake had caused the prison doors to open. And he says, what must I do to be saved? In verse 30 of Acts 16, he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved and your household, your family. And they spoke the word of God to him and to all who were in his house. Verse 32 of Acts 16, verse 33. And he took them at the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. What? Wait a minute, Paul, it's the middle of the night. Come on, we can wait till the next day. Let's pray about this. Let's make sure they're really saved. Let's make sure. No, in the middle of the night. Because remember, was, I think it was at midnight that the prison doors were opened up. So this has got to be kind of in the middle of the night, or maybe it's starting to get towards morning. Anyway, it's not the normal hour for baptisms, no. <laughs> maybe it was 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. Anyway, but to see the early church knew the importance of water baptism. They knew it, and that's why it was, and I'll, we're going to get into what the water baptism means in a minute. Anyway, so there's other verses. I want, I want to go one more place for you, and that's Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul comes to Ephesus for the first time. There have been other Christians there, but Paul comes to Ephesus. Acts 19, verse 1. And he found some disciples, and he said to them in verse 2, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, And in what then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. How many remember that John the Baptist was baptizing people? For repentance. They were not being baptized into Christ. They were just being baptized to show that they had repented, right? Right. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in the one who has come after you, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, guess what? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they started speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were seven men in all, or 12 men in all. Yeah, do you see a pattern? Do you see a pattern? And, and, there, and I, there's many other verses that talk about immediately being baptized. Anyway, why? Why was baptized? Why water baptism? Why not wait to the next Sunday, the next Lord's Day, the next month, the next year? Why? That's where we're, I'm going to read from Romans 6. Romans 6. This is the Apostle Paul in, in his letter to the Romans. And he says, What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might be bound? In other words, just because we're under the grace of God, does that mean we should just go ahead and sin? By no means. How can we who died to st still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that as just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we might, to, might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in, in a death like this, we shall also be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self, our old man, hallelujah, was crucified with him, on the, hallelujah, on the cross, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, or done away with in some translations, so it would be no longer be slaves to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. How many know any dead people that are sinning still? And verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. In Christ Jesus. You see, the believers understood. He said, do you not know, verse 3, the believers knew that water baptism meant death to your old life. Death to you, to your old sinful self. They understood that. But Paul says, did you not know? Did, didn't you not have the right teaching on this? You're, you're, you know, you're baptized into his death and raised with him. Don't you, don't you know about that? And then he says something... He talks about a similar thing about baptism in Colossians 2, starting in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty, uh, empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Isn't that wonderful? All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And you have been filled, or filled, another translation, completed in him, in Christ, who's the head of all Roman authority. Okay, you're complete in Christ. Verse 10. Ha, ah, but something more. Verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. They understood that they were burying their old life, and Jesus was performing a spiritual circus. I believe that body, what's the body of flesh? You still have a body when you come out of the baptism. That's, your, I believe, your old sinful nature that was crucified with Christ on the cross when you surrendered to him. And, and anyway, and this Greek ties it in together, having been buried with him in, that, in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. Here's my testimony on that. I read Romans 6. I said, oh, I need to be water baptized. I just sprinkled as an infant. That's not enough. I need to be buried with Jesus. Yeah. So I went to that. It's a denominational church to get baptized when I, right after I graduated from, my, from college. And my, I, the pastor, I said, we're getting ready to go into the baptism waters. I said, okay, now what's supposed to happen to me? Oh, nothing. It's just, it's just symbolic of what you already did. What? But I read I was going to be buried with him and raised with him. What? Nothing? I was disappointed. So I went through the motions of it, but I was disappointed. I didn't have faith in the working of God that Colossians 2.12 talks about. Later on, when I learned about the truth, yes, get that old man cut away. Hallelujah. Not everyone believes in this, but uh, the sense, well, I believe it retroactively. Okay, believe it retroactively that you didn't know about it. But I was led to, I want to be baptized in faith, knowing when I go into those waters, I am burying my life, cut away, I could no longer use this excuse. Yeah, well, you just have this sinful nature, you know. You're just going to have to sin. Nothing you can do about it. You'll be free when you see Jesus uh, after you die. So wait a minute. So I need to trust more in my physical death as, for my holiness than the death of Christ? Wait a minute. I think I'm supposed to be focused on the death of Christ for my holiness, not my own physical death. <laughs> I'm waiting. Okay, finally I'll get rid of this sinful nature when I see Jesus face to face. Until then, nothing I can do about it. Just going to be have this sin nature dragging around. How many? I believe that this circumcision talks about uh, how else? Would, what's the body of flesh being cut? Something got cut off, put off. What was it? I believe it was my sinful nature, and I was rebaptized. Hallelujah! I can no longer <laughs> say you can only say, "Oh, you're just going to sin anyway because you have this sinful nature." Hallelujah! <laughs> I died, <laughs> and my sinful nature was buried. Cut away by Jesus in a circumcision. Glory to God! I guess I'll have to amen my own sermon. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, you know, that's why I believe that they were baptized so quickly. They knew what baptism meant. And then my next point is the, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Why isn't it just enough to have the Spirit of Jesus in us? Why do we need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, let me just share something with you. In John, some verses with you. In John 20, after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus breathed on them. This is John 20, 19 through 22. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is before Pentecost, right after the resurrection. I believe, I don't, can't prove it, but when he blew on them or breathed on them and said, I believe something happened to them. <laughs> when Jesus blew on them and said, receive I believe, I personally believe the indwelling spirit came then. But even though they had the indwelling spirit, they needed to be clothed with the spirit for power as a witness. In Luke 20, 24, 49, he says, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but you stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You stay here. And then in Acts 1, Luke repeats this, this, this thing, this conversation, uh, unless it's a, a repeated one. While they're, in, in Acts 1, 4 says, and while staying with them, Jesus was staying with them, he ordered them not, this is after he rose from the dead now, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they so anyway, so, so the, uh, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> he says, don't worry about that now. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. How many know they needed 
the Spirit's power, not just the indwelling Spirit, but the power of the Spirit to be his witnesses. Yes, because if you look at Peter, after he was in John 20, if you got, some of the, if you got the Spirit of Jesus, and guess what Peter did in John 21? He said, let's go fishing. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're, let's go fishing. <laughs> he wasn't, not as, let's, not be, let's go be a witness to the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> Let's go fishing. Huh? Guess what? Who appears to him again? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Jesus, uh, they didn't catch anything. And then he t- tells them to throw the net over on the other side. And anyway, they had Peter. But guess what happened after, after Acts, Acts 2 came? What happened to Peter after Acts 2 came? After he got filled. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, Acts 2 they were all together in one place, and then suddenly there was this heavenly sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. I think it's very interesting. In John 20, he just breathed on them, and here is a mighty rushing wind. Actually, in the Greek, it's the same word, pneuma. <laughs> Breath, wind, or spirit. I believe initial faith in Christ, we receive the breath, but how many know we also need the wind? <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit. And and anyway, and, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I remember in my senior year, when I gave my whole life to Jesus, I said, okay, Lord of all, this is two, within two years after I first received Christ, Lord of all, and then, and then I went to a retreat that they talked about, two retreats actually, once about, one about full commitment to Christ, it was with Campus Crusade for Christ. And the second one was about being filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything, about, hardly anything about the Holy Spirit. But I believed that day I asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it changed my life. I asked in faith. I asked in faith, and it changed my life. Because, you know what, it's God's will to be, for you to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, drunk says, I mean drunk. <laughs> Paul says, do not get drunk with wine. That is debauchery, but be Filled with the Holy with the Spirit. The, the, the Greek there is be continually filled. So there's initial filling, and then he says, and then you'll be singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to your Lord, giving thanks always for everything. How many know you need to be filled with the Spirit to give thanks always for everything? <laughs> to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's commanded to be filled. If God commands us to be filled, how many know it's just God's will that we don't have to beg him? We can just believe, ask and believe in faith. Amen? Because it's his will to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I also believe that if he fills you, he will give you the ability to speak in tongues. People say, do I have speaking tongues to be filled with the Spirit? No. But guess what? If you get filled, I believe he's given you that ability. It's just a matter of speaking out what God's put in you. And that's what happened to me later. God released me with this praying in the Spirit. Uh, later when I was prayed for, actually at a church in Chicago. Anyway... Um, it's the same church I was rebaptized, actually. Uh, anyway, so, so let me just summarize here. Um, water baptism, along with repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ, means being co-buried and co-raised with Christ. Maybe, did I, I don't know if I said that already. And then, and, and, what, and then you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that. Here's the result of all this. You become a brand new, a crea- new creation of God. You become a brand, if any man, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You become a new creation of God. You become, instead of a sinner by nature, a saint because Jesus becomes your righteousness and your holiness. Uh, And again, now what it is, your life becomes Jesus Christ living his life through you by the power of the Spirit. Not you trying to live the Christian life, but Jesus living his life through you by the power of his Spirit. That's what happened to my life. And so the Christian life, in the bottom line is this, it's the exchange of your old life for Jesus Christ as your new life. And Jesus Christ becomes your new life because as followers following Jesus, guess who's the only one that can truly follow Jesus? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the only one who can truly follow Jesus. 
The Spirit of Jesus, I should, maybe should say, the Spirit of Jesus is truly the only one. You know, you have to die and let Jesus live his life through you. And that's what the only other early Christian understands. So again, I give you Galatians 2.20. You know, Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's the Christian life. And Christ becomes your life. And the church, in a sense, becomes Christ, becomes the body of Christ. I want to close with these verses. Colossians 3, 1 through 11. I won't read all of them. But Paul says, If you have then been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. By the way, Ephesians 2, 6 says, Not only were you raised, you were ascended with him and seated with him at the right hand of God. Ephesians, so you can seek the things above. Actually, you're seated with Christ in the things above. All right. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. For you have died. Has everyone died here once at least? If you haven't, you need to die. And, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, Christ becomes your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. And it goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of it. But uh, it's Christ living his life through you by the power of his spirit. So, so this, is, this is how you follow Christ. Let Jesus live his life through you. How many say an amen to that? Amen. amen. But it involves, you know, a full surrender to him, being filled with your spirit, burying your old life, being raised to new life. Amen. And I'm going to just say a prayer here in just a minute after I take a drink. Isn't this, I tell you, gospel means good news. This is the good news. Not only that he died for your sins, but he wants to become your life and live his life through you by the power of his spirit. Then your, his spirit can truly follow what he wants you to do. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, that you sent Jesus to die for our sins so that we don't have the punishment of sin on us anymore. We don't have the penalty of sin. Thank you for eternal life, Lord. But thank you also, Lord, that we died with you. And our old self died with you and was buried. And we were raised with you, Jesus. And we ascended with you. And we're seated with you at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Lord. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Let's all stand right now. Let's all stand right now and ask God, you know, if there's anyone here that says, hey, Pastor Rick, I don't know. I've got some things I'm hanging on to. I, I don't know if I'm fully surrendered. I don't know. Father, I just pray that you'd show everyone here, Lord. Everyone in here, Lord, if, if they're holding back something and they're not fully surrendered, show them, Father. Show them, Lord. Full surrender, Lord. Show them, Lord, if they need to bury their old self in baptism and be raised with you. Show them, Lord if they really need to be filled with your spirit, Lord. Yes, Lord, I just ask you for that, Jesus. Show them. Show them, Lord. Let's, yes, just, let's just lift our hands to God and say, Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us. Fill me. Take full control of my life. Fill me with your spirit. Live your life through me. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you that you want to live your life through me by the power of your spirit. Your life becomes my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Thank you. We worship you, God.